Um, my name is Joy Kendi. I am a fashion and lifestyle content creator. I've been doing this since I was 21. So a very long time. Can I just get like an age range for you guys? Uh, people over 30? Oh, so there's some of us. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so I started off with a blog where I just did uh, primarily just fashion, fashion on a budget, how to shop in Gikomba, to a market, um, how to get good looks under 500 bob, things like that. So that's how I started. And then it slowly just started to evolve, especially with social media and things like that. And um, just what I was interested in when it came to content creation. So it moved from fashion to then beauty to hair. Um, then everything else kind of came with it. So food, traveling, tech, and things like that. So I've been doing this for a while. Um, Job-wise, I've been doing this for, let's say, five years. Um, that was the first time I got like my first proper gig. Um, I had a few sporadic ones in the beginning, but I was ripped off. But that's a story for another day. Um, but full-time, I've been doing this properly for four years. Now, um, when it comes to content creation, sorry, let me just, I have my points and things. OK, so when it comes to content creation, I'm assuming a lot of you guys are trying to get it to turn into a full-time business in some way, right? So when it comes to content creation and it becoming a business, you have to look at it in the business sense. What can you do to turn it into a business? So some people have turned their content creation into starting their own businesses. Um, people such as uh, Nancy Mwai. She started off as a content creator, then she started her own business and used her following to bring revenue to her and her designs and things like that. Now, outside of that, there's an advertising aspect of content creation. So basically, when you see anybody on YouTube or on Instagram and they're promoting a brand and you can see the hashtag ad paid partnership, you're making money from that brand, right? And the way to do that is to, number one, find, because people always have this mentality of like you have to have one niche. You don't. Because also, Kenya is quite small when it comes to the content creation aspect and making money off of content creation. So when you make yourself so um, structured into one thing, it also makes it harder for you to get opportunities in other things. So for example, for me, I majority of my content is based around fashion. But I actually make almost no money from fashion. All of my money comes in from makeup, beauty, skincare. Majority of my money comes in from food, <laughs> drinks, travel, and tech. That's where majority of my money comes in. So the way I decided that works, the way I decided to make it work for me was to basically know why people follow me. So a lot of women, majority, majority of my following, 80% are female. So a lot of them who follow me, they're following me to know what is she wearing? What's her hair like? How can I get whatever, whatever, whatever? So I decided to always put that as my main focus for whatever it is that I'm doing, but then add other things to it. So if I'm doing a traveling thing for, let's say, Jumbo Jet, um, yeah, we're going to go, we're traveling with Jumbo, how to go to Diani on a budget, blah, 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 blah. But I always make sure to incorporate white people following me. So I always make sure to always still have the entire thing revolving around fashion, beauty, and things like that. Um, when I'm doing things for EABL, so how to make good cocktails and blah, 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 blah. Yes, how to make the cocktail, how to sell the drink to um, my people, who of course are adults and all that, but also what to wear when you're going out with the girls and things like that. Tech, um, because I do a lot of content creation and I am self-taught and I do everything by myself. I do not have a team, so I am my own photographer, videographer, editor, um, manager, <laughs> uh, except the tax person, but I do everything myself. Um, when it comes to tech, I show people how to use certain devices to be able to create content. So if it's a phone, how to take great selfies, how to edit, how to shoot videos, tutorials, things like that, things that people want to buy a specific phone for. Does that make sense? OK, so what I'm saying, you don't have to focus so much on one thing. Just keep yourself always flexible enough to where if anybody hits you up, Insurance. I've done insurance. I've done banking. If anybody hits you up, you can find a way to incorporate whatever it is that they're trying or whatever message that they have and sell it to your audience. Because at the end of the day, that's what they're using you for. 
So when it comes to, I guess a lot of you guys want to figure out how to, number one, get clients and how to do your rate card, right? So when it comes to clients, um, I'm a firm believer of people don't know you exist unless they know you exist. So the best way to do that is to force that, like force them to know who you are. So for me, what I did was in the beginning years, I would literally stalk every single client I have ever worked with to this day. Every single client that I work with to this day had proposals sent to them, had emails, I'd go to their offices and things like that. Now, the way to determine which company is willing to work with you is you have to determine whether or not the company even has offices in Kenya. So for example, I, I sometimes see people tagging Apple like in hopes that maybe Apple will hit them up. Apple has never worked even with the Kardashians. They're not going to work with anybody. And number two, they don't have offices in Kenya. So it doesn't make sense to approach brands that don't even exist in our market, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you need to make market money in our market. So um, figuring out if they have offices here. So a lot of companies actually do have offices here. Um, when it comes to beauty, MAC Cosmetics, Maybelline, uh, L'Oreal, all of them have offices in Kenya. Tech, uh, Samsung, Techno, all of them have offices in Kenya. Um, so you just have to first figure out who has offices based in Kenya, because if they have offices in Kenya, that means that they have a marketing department, which means that they possibly have funds possible to give to possible influences. Outside of that, understanding your agencies. I've spoken to a lot of people who can't even name two agencies in Kenya. Agencies are literally the middleman between major clients and yourself. If the client, if the, um, if the middleman does not even know that you exist, there's no way for you to actually get work. And a good way to get the middleman to know that you exist is, um, for example, what I did, I figured out the brands that I wanted to work with, products that I wanted to push more of, and then I would look online for like the hashtags, but find the Kenyan ones. So things like Mac, Maybelline, things like that, I would just post makeup things and hashtag or at like the Mac Africa or um, Maybelline Africa, things like that, so that they can see that I exist. And you just do that until eventually somebody is inspired enough with what you do. And I know it feels like it's free advertising, but again, if they don't know that you're there, anyways, it doesn't really matter. So at the end of the day, just finding, figure out who you want to work with and figure out what hashtags they use. If they have pages on Instagram, if they're based in Kenya, and then use that to your advantage and create content around that. So that's what I personally did. So um, my first job was with Mac Cosmetics. Um, I went through the entire Instagram page. I looked at what kind of work they like, um, what their entire layout looks like, what kind of products they try to push. And that's how I catered all of my content to look like that. So even if I wasn't necessarily pushing for Mac or pushing for Maybelline, any other brand that does makeup would see it and be like, oh, OK, that could actually work. So that's how I did it. So that was my specific strategy from the get-go in the beginning. Um, so now let's talk about rate cards. Uh, so when it comes to rate cards, there is a specific um, algorithm or mathematical formula that you're supposed to use, but this is an international formula. So that international formula is not um, useful as much in Kenya because we're a very small market. So they're not going to pay me as much as they pay an American influencer who has the exact same following as me. They won't. We're a very small market. So um, the algorithm or the formula is you take your following and you multiply it by 0.001 to 0.006. You determine which one, which numbers between that you want to use. And the, is that the high of the number? Hold on, let me just do the math real quick. Um, so let's say, let's use Kylie Jenner as an example, right? So Kylie Jenner usually posts, like she gets a million dollars for one post. So for, Kylie, she does, so she has around like 100 million <laughs> followers times 0.006. Okay, times 0.01. Okay, so the higher your, so when you go to 0.006, that means that you, ha you have a higher engagement. When you go to 0.001, your engagement is not as high. So you have to figure out where you are in that spectrum, okay? 
I can't tell if you guys are with me. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so that's how you figure out your formula and then that's how you figure out your math. Now, Kenya is a very small market, so they're not gonna pay you if you have, like for example, the influencers in the US who have 20,000 followers and they get paid like $1,000 per post, like one post. We do not have that same market. And the reason why we do not have that same market, and I think a lot of people need to understand this, yes, technically we are 40 million people and above, but when it comes to the actual percentage of people who have that extra money to buy a phone for 200K or to buy a laptop for 300, it's a way different number than guys in South Africa. Completely different number than guys in the US. So we are, we are a very small market. So you kind of use that as a way to just kind of get a basis of what your rate is. And what I usually personally like to do is I have three different rate cards. So I have a high, a medium, and a low. So my low is just like the lowest that I'm willing to go. And it's usually for brands who I know, like they come in and out type of thing and they don't, and I, like, and they, and they don't have like a crazy budget. And I'm willing to work with them because I genuinely do love the brand. Then I have a medium, which is usually like majority of most uh, posts and that usually most of my rates are. And then we always have the high. And for the high, I use the US rating system. And once in a while, you'll get a brand who's just like, okay, cool. And they don't argue with you, which is fantastic. Now, with, with, with whatever rate card you have, always have, um, always be willing to negotiate with clients um, in the sense you, you don't want to say no to a job because there's a 5k difference. Sometimes it's just a simple communication with them. Try to reduce how many deliverables you're going to give them. So instead of three posts, I'll give you two to make up the difference, things like that. Um, but d does that kind of make sense when it comes to rates? Yeah. Okay, so that's how I generally do my rates. Um, okay, so now let's say you've gotten your job. How, like, not even gotten the job, you've gotten a client who's hit you up and they've given you the rates and you're okay with that, what's the next step? Once you have whatever client has hit you up, you guys need to first figure out what it is that the client is trying to sell, what, what message it is, what product it is, whatever the case, you need to figure that out. And then you guys will go back and forth trying to figure out the best way to, to deliver that message, whether it's in video form, whether it's in written form, photography, whatever the case, you'll kind of have to negotiate that with the client. Um, once you figure that out, there's a production aspect. Now, I'm a firm believer, I don't, like it's not for everybody, but I'm a firm believer of, um, especially as a content creator in the beginning, learn how to do everything yourself, um, save up. I was doing internships, working multiple jobs, and that's how I made the money that I could to be able to save up for like my first camera. And mind you, at that time, I wasn't making that much money like, at all. So it's one of those, like I had to save up for like eight months to even get one camera. So during that entire process, I would, teach myself how to use a camera, um, all the properties of a camera, um, how to shoot great quality, how to edit. That really honestly saves your life. You can have like a camera that's not the best quality, but then once you edit it, you can make it look like you use the most expensive camera that you've ever used. So it's not even about, about the equipment that you have, it's just being able to utilize what you have and making the best of it. And how I taught myself was literally out of the University of YouTube. I taught myself how to do everything. And the reason why I usually advocate for that is because financially speaking, and also when you actually get to the point where you're having a lot of jobs, if you always have to rely on a photographer or a videographer to come and shoot you and edit for you, and let's say they have a wedding that's gonna pay them triple or quadruple what you're gonna pay them, they're gonna take that job and now what's gonna happen? You're not gonna be able to do the work because somebody's not available. So learn how to do everything yourself. You, you, Self-sufficiency in this industry is one of the best things you can ever do for yourself. Um, so you guys have gotten the job. Um, now you guys need to figure out the, I mean, you've done the production aspect. Uh, when it comes to majority of content creation in Kenya, when you go through agencies, there's the contracts and everything else. But a lot of companies like to approve things. So you always have to send it in. And I know for the creatives, they don't like being told that you have to send it in for approval, but it is what it is. If somebody is gonna pay you 300K, you just have to send it in for approval. It is what it is. So there's that process, then you post, and then um, they go through your algorithm at the end. So not really, sorry, your stats at the end. So that, that's what helps determine whether or not you will continue working with them in the future. You don't need an expensive camera. You don't need expensive editing software. A lot of these things are very affordable nowadays. You can get apps that charge you 200 bob a month 
like Lightroom, things like that, that edit professionally and give you amazing quality for a budget. So there's no reason as to why you're like, okay, so I've had conversations with people who they want to start, but they just don't know when to start. Just do it. It's not that serious. Grow slowly. It's better to build um, an authentic uh, following just as you grow than always waiting for the right time. So now how to build your audience. Am I talking too fast? Cool. Okay. So how to build your audience. So there's multiple ways. Number one, the way I did it was just, it was just slow, steady with my people. We just, 10 years, we just did it slowly. We took our time. Um, there's collaborations, always working with people in the same industry as you. Um, if you're a photographer or uh, collaborating with other photographers. If you're a photographer, collaborating with fashion content creators, doing their photography, getting your name out there. If you're fashion content creators, working together just so that one audience can help replenish another one and vice versa. Um, outside of that, I mean, you can always try Instagram promoting things, but then my only issue is that when you do the Instagram ads is that it triggers Instagram's algorithm to be like, oh, so they'll pay that as soon as you stop everything goes down. And it stays like that for a very long time. Because at the end of the day, they're trying to get that money. So I personally am not a huge fan of promoting your page or doing paid promotions, especially as a content creator. Because at the end of the day, um, your algorithm is the most important thing. And also keeping the consistency of what your insights are bringing in, like the back end. You have to keep that constant. So if it plunges just because you stopped paying, highly it, it's, it sucks. Another thing, <laughs> don't buy followers. Don't do it. It used to work like five years ago because a lot of people never used to do their research. But a lot of agencies do research like crazy. Wowzy, they do their research. They are programs that can literally open your entire page from the back end and determine who's fake and who's real and the percentage of fake pages versus real pages. So. I would highly recommend never buying followers. And also, at the end of the day, if you buy followers, just be willing to commit. If you buy followers, you have to keep buying engagement, because otherwise the math is not going to math. So if you have a million followers, but you get 20 likes, it ain't mathing. So you just have to commit to the entire lie, which is very expensive in the long run. Um, so that's generally how I would think like the best way for you to build um, an engage, I mean, to build a following. Uh, so collaboration and also just um, naturally doing it that way. Um, another thing when it comes to followings, trying to put your foot in as many platforms as possible. You might blow up more on one platform than you would another, and that is fine. That platform will be your main platform, and you can make money off that platform. So like for me, for instance, I'm on YouTube, I'm on, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok. I always try to make sure that I stay consistent in all those platforms because you just never know, number one. And also you're giving um, possible clients more, more value and also giving them more opportunities to try out your different platforms and also giving you more opportunities to make more money, which is always fantastic. Um, OK, so finances when it comes to content creation. I, okay, I learned the hard way. When you start making money, I don't care how much it is. Treat that amount of money like you might not get any more anytime soon, especially in the beginning, for sure for the first year. Save, 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 save. Don't get too comfortable because the way this industry works and it comes to payments and things like that, it's not like a salary where you know on the 5th of every single month, on the 27th of every single month, you're going to get a paycheck. Actually, before we even get to that, something very important, because I just saw Vanessa over there. Y'all need to read your contracts. <laughs> I have hung out with so many young content creators who never read their contracts. They just sign it, and then they go, and then they complain. And in the contract, it states things in there specifically that they're complaining about. So. In, I want to say, majority of contracts in most agencies, payments happen 30 to 45 days after job completed. 
So you finished your entire campaign, like let's say it was a month campaign, you're doing one post a week, you finished on the 30th. You're not gonna get paid on the first. People get confused with that and then they go on Twitter, which also blacklists you, which is another topic. In most contracts, you get paid 30 to 45 days after work is done. So always read your contract so you can verify that. If you want to negotiate, do it before you sign the contract. If you need 50% down before you do the job, that's fine, but do it before you sign the contract. Because once you signed it, it is what it is. You can't complain about not being paid for 30 days after the job has been done and it says 45 days. So always make sure that you read the contract. Um, outside of that, the small little detail of, like the way I mentioned that if you complain, sometimes you can be blacklisted. It's not even necessarily about the complaint. It's the um, how somebody goes at it and why they did it. So for example, you complaining about not being paid, but the contract says 30 days after and you're on day two of job completed. That's your mistake. And when it comes to blacklisting in this industry, a lot of the things that people don't seem to realize is you'll work, when you're working with agencies, the person who's handling you they're human beings. So how you treat them will dictate how, if they wanna work with you in the long run. Cause I've seen situations where somebody is so polite to the main client, like they're the sweetest butterfly that you've ever met. But then as soon as a client leaves the room, like the demon comes out of them and they speak to anybody and anybody like they're cockroaches on their floor. Forgetting that that person in the middle over there is a reason why you have the job. So always, be polite, always be nice, always be kind, treat people with respect the same way you want them to treat you, never get cocky, because human beings are very personal, hum like, like it's just a personal thing. If somebody gives you a bad, if you guys have a very bad exchange, would you wanna work with them again, just in general? No, so always just treat people with respect, especially in this industry. You're dealing with human beings and you're always gonna deal with human beings. And also, people talk. So you think that you burnt one bridge in one agency. Trust me, that person in that agency is gonna move to a, to a different agency and they, it'll just spread like wildfire. So always be kind, always treat people with respect and always be professional. If you say you're gonna deliver something on a specific date, do it, no questions asked. If you cannot for a very specific reason, let them know in advance. A lot of people are actually quite chill. But the aspect of just not telling anybody and then just, yeah, just post what I want. It doesn't work in this industry. Contracts are contracts are contracts. And I know creatives, we kind of like to let the, to be inspired, and then that's what will get you going. We, like, that's great, but also there's deadlines, and they exist. And also you can get, you can also not get paid if you, la if you um, let the, if you do not abide to that contract. Okay, so understanding every single aspect of your job means understanding everything from, we already talked about the aspect of the content creation aspect, um, videography, shooting, editing, understanding that part, but also you need to understand the back end, the business side. So negotiations, management, um, figuring out your costs, uh, understanding how and where to contact certain um, agencies and who to contact. So for example, when I mentioned Oops, sorry, I keep hitting the mic. So for example, when I mentioned that um, I got my first jobs basically by stalking clients and finding out the agencies and the offices that they work with, it's not speaking to anybody in that area. You have to speak to marketing directors, the people who have the monies. You can't speak to just the guy who works at the front. They, they don't have any um, rights when it comes to actual work. So understanding that part and knowing who to talk to and when to talk to them is the most important thing when it comes to um, content creation. And how do you get the um, marketing director's numbers and contact information? Majority of the time, if you go to a lot of these offices, um, uh, let's say L'Oreal. So L'Oreal handles like multiple brands, everything from like Maybelline to L'Oreal products themselves, Garnier, everything. So if you go to that specific office, and ask for the marketing director, you can get their email address and send a profile. Oh yes, get a profile. Build a profile. Your profile should have a, like slides upon slides of everything that any client needs to know about you. I have two different kinds. I have a brief profile, because there are some clients who are like, I kind of know everything about you, but we just need to have an official one, so just give us one slide of a very quick brief. What do you do? Who have you worked with? And how long have you been working for those people? 
that's it. Then you have a separate one where it's a proper breakdown where the first page is your bio, who you are, what you've been doing, what your speciali uh, specialties are, everything from that. Then your second page are your stats. And in those stats, you basically take screenshots of the back end of every single one of your pages. So if it's Instagram, if it's YouTube, if it's Twitter, if it's TikTok, basically your insights that shows your um, demographic, um, the age, the country, everybody that your followers are. Um, then after that, I usually tend to immediately just jump to people that I've worked with. If I've not worked with anybody, which like in the beginning when I had not worked with anybody yet, I would use examples of random posts that I did that I just did out of my own free will. Something that was um, similar to what the client is doing. So for example, it was a makeup thing. I just put slides of makeup videos and um, photos that I did. It wasn't paid, but like I, just to show how good I am and why I am worth it. So once you have all that put together, that's what you send to marketing directors and or agencies. Now, please, <laughs> I'm trying to find a nice way to not sound like an auntie. So if you have an email address that says badgirl29 at gmail.com, that ain't it, sis. <laughs> If, you, if those are your email addresses, I need you to get a professional email address that's just your name at Gmail, Yahoo, whatever the case. Because I receive emails like that, and I'm just like, I get that you're trying to come from like a, but I can't take it seriously. If I see badgirl29 at Yahoo, I don't know what to do with that information. Another thing, when it comes to emails that you send to agencies, these guys don't have time. They're dealing with like, outside of the people who they're paying, which are usually hundreds at a time, they're also dealing with new coming information. So you need to be brief and straight to the point. There's, I've seen those emails of, hi, so me, I just really like content creation. Like some people literally type how they speak and you can't do that. It has to come in in a professional way because if you're dealing with 100 other people during the course of a day, the last thing that you wanna do is, hi, my name is Linda, so I've been thinking, and I think you guys would be so good for me because it doesn't work like that. So change your email address if you're still badgirl21 and, oh, bad boy 83 I don't know. Change it. And um, if you usually get nervous when it comes to email addresses, I have a copy and paste one that I always have on my laptop when I am proposing new jobs. And also, ooh, Biggest mistake, don't copy and paste and not edit. Like where you're sending something to Maybelline and then you just send it as, dear Samsung. You get? So being as professional as you possibly can. Um, I think I kind of just tried to go through as fast as I could, like the basics, because I kind of wanted to get a lot of questions from you guys or from the Zoom. OK, so does anybody have any specific questions? when it comes to content creation and the money aspect in business. Um, when it comes to things like that, I personally, I don't know if just maybe I'm old school, I, I love seeing faces behind the brand. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, um, I'll give a perfect example, Nancy Mwai. Uh, do you know who she is? Okay, yeah. So Nancy Mwai, because you're a man, I don't know. <laughs> like, she's fabulous. Okay, so Nancy Mwai, for instance, uh, she started off as a content creator that she eventually built her brand, which is New Level. So her clothing brand. And this also happened also with my friend Kristen Jockey, where she did separate. But then, um, like for example, my friend Chris, she started noticing that there was a huge difference when it came to um, how the audience would take in her brand and her product when she was involved in it. So, I mean, she has her icon page, but her products sell way better when everybody knows like, oh, so, oh okay, so that's what it looks like on you. That's what, I think that when it comes to certain products, people like that personal touch where you don't want it to be so separate that it looks like you're promoting a separate brand. So I don't believe that you need to separate them. I, I believe that you can have separate pages like where you have your page where you are a father and you're just talking about you being a father. 
and then the other, I mean, also you just hanging out and things like that. And then the other page being you as a father still, because it doesn't, once you, like, if, even if you separate the pages, you're still a father, and the things that you're promoting are what would make you happy as a father that you personally love, right? on that page. So I don't believe you should separate them. Like separate them in the sense like where there's two different pages so that you can still be able to post just random things just for yourself, but then still have that touch that is you. So that when people come to that page, they know, like let's say if you talk about like, oh, this um, hospital has the best peri uh, pediatrics, whatever, 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 um, because my child, we went and there's a storyline, da, 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 da they still have that personal touch versus if you separated it and you're no longer part of it, it just sounds like an ad. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. So I don't think you should separate them. I think you should still do them, but just different pages, especially when it comes to family things. I feel like people really like faces attached to. Yeah, it also makes you feel safe. Like you wouldn't, if you would do that, if you would take your child there, that means it's a safe space. Yeah. When it comes to the niche aspect, I feel like number one, don't overthink it. Do what's first comfortable with you. Because the thing that people also don't realize, content creation for it to be full time is also very exhausting. So if you try to force something that is not naturally yours, you will burn out incredibly fast, like incredibly fast. Especially now, like when I first, like when Instagram first started, people were happy with just like two posts a week. Now you got to post daily. So number one, you don't have to force it. If you want to add in other things, do it because that is like your, the natural thing. But the way you said, like, do I have to start with fashion and then wait for people? It sounds like you're almost forcing the like, I'm going to have to focus so hard on only nothing but fashion before I can start expanding my reach. And also, you never know which with which with which. which, which with whatever direction you go, you might actually start getting more followers. Like if you start introducing other things such as food, travel, um, where you and your friends go out for drinks or partying or da 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 da, just adding that part can bring in more followers who are interested in what it is that you do and then they start getting interested in your fashion. So you don't, you're not, like the thing about content creation is you can literally do anything. You don't have to pick one niche. Um, for me, my niche is more in the fashion aspect because that's easy for me. Like clothes and style is easy for me. And then now me incorporating that with everything else is easier. Versus if I was like, ha, huh, well, tech pays well, so let me force phones and then see what happens. It, 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 becomes, like, it becomes very draining. So do what you want to do that is natural for you, that is simple for you and then um, slowly start incorporating other stuff. If you want to start incorporating now, do it now. Now, when it comes to you and your fashion, um, you don't want people to be too confused about whether or not you're a designer or are you just a chick who likes clothes. So I would have two separate pages. So um, again, I'll use Chris as a perfect example. She has her personal page, and then she has Icon. Icon is strictly for her clothing and for selling the clothing. Then she uses her page to wear the clothing to do her lifestyle things, where you can see her living her life, going on date nights in her clothing, and then you can go to the page to go buy it. Does that make sense? So when it comes to the design aspect, have a separate page for you. I mean, for your work, for your designs, that where nobody can get it confused, and then still have your page. But then have them both on your main profile so people can know where to, I don't know if I'm in the bio, yeah. Okay, so that is called block shooting. I am a firm believer of block shooting. For example, I was here by what, two? So from the hours of eight o'clock this morning to two, I shot five videos. That is block shooting, and you're now covered for five whole days. So you pick certain days, because also for your sanity, for me, I shoot three times a week. I don't shoot every single day. And the reason why I do that is because if you do, like you will burn out. So you pick a specific day and you, basically structure out a way for you to shoot in a way that everything kind of aligns to what you're doing. Sorry, I know I keep giving makeup examples, man. I'm so sorry, but 
That's what I do. Um, so for example, if I have five paying clients and I need to shoot for the, like, and I need to shoot everything in one day. So for example, um, skincare, I'll wake up in the morning, take a shower, I have no makeup, I'll do my skincare video. Done, one, one content creation done. Then, oh, I have a makeup video that I need to do. Then we do our makeup, makeup transition. Another client is out of the way. Oh, I have to do an outfit picture because also you sometimes have to mix up paid partnerships and regular contents because if you just have paid, 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 engagement goes down. So now I have done my makeup, so let me just do a random outfit video just that's not a paid partnership just for fun. I'll do that. Oh, I have an insurance company. What's the topic? Oh, we're doing that. I'll shoot that since I already have my makeup on. Done. Oh, okay, I work with EABL. Since I already have my makeup on, oh, and I have a new dress. Ha, cocktail video, done. Five videos, done one day. Block shooting. But you have to be really, 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 really disciplined. And it takes practice to be able to do that. So what I personally do when it comes to just money in general, I have two accounts. So I have my small checks go into one account, and that's the one that's usually attached to my M-Pesa. Then I have the large account. So the large account is any big checks, whether it's monthly or it's like one big check that comes in, goes into that for like my future to future invest um, in whatever way I want to do. So do I reinvest 100%? Um, the percentage is, I don't really know the percentage how much I reinvest in my company, but what I do is I, every few, like every year, I try to determine if I need to replace new equipment or buy new equipment. So that's how I do that. Um, number two, when I told you guys about saving money, it's super important. Um, I don't buy things just to be buying things. I know some people who will just buy a brand new 650,000 shilling camera that I'm just like vibes. I could have given you the same image with Lightroom and a phone. You didn't have to go through all that mess. So for me, when it comes to reinvesting in my company, majority of the time, like for example, this year is the very first time in my entire life, like it was a milestone for me, in my entire life, I've ever owned a brand new laptop. I have never. My soul, because I am cheap in my heart. I am, I am still a broke college girl, and I, and I refuse to get out of that, because that's how you go broke. I still live under my budget. So I bought my very first camp, I mean, my very first brand new laptop with a box, and it unsealed, and, I, and then I dropped it the next day, and now it has a, I died a little bit on the inside, because that hurt me, and I was like, see, this is why I buy used things, because they know how to survive. But... <laughs> Outside of that, just in general, when it comes to equipment and all that stuff, you don't need to always reinvest every single year. Buy what's broken. I mean, fix what's broken or replace what's broken. If it works, it works. My camera, the one that I use on a daily, is over 10 years old. And I bought it used. Do you know how old that thing is? Like the card that I use, it's a CF card. The camera guys here know what's up. It's an old camera, right? CF, it's a card this thick. It's like, what, do you remember the old PlayStations? My over 30s, the disc, they, it's like a version of that, but for, but it works and the quality is fantastic. And instead of buying a new 300,000 camera, I just bought a new lens that was 50 and it, it acts like it's new, acts. So that's like reinvest, only buy what is needed to be bought. Don't just buy just to buy. And buy used when you're starting off. It's never that serious. And learn how to use, learn how to work with what you got. Did that answer your question? Akako. I sometimes digress. That laptop thing really hurt my spirit. It has a little dent. Uh, so parting shot. Um, my biggest parting shot, no matter where you are in this industry, uh, be patient. It is a marathon, not a sprint. There is only like a very small percentage, like let's say 5% of people who will ever blow up overnight. Um, the rest of us, it's a slow game. It's a very slow game and you'd actually prefer that. Um, for example, for me, I used to beat myself up all the time when I was like 27, like why am I not like this person? Why, like, why am I not making money like this other person? But then I realized now, like if I did, I knew my brain was not mentally prepared for that. So like things come to you when they're supposed to come to you. Um, so yeah, just be patient in the process, grow your following, 
in your pace. Uh, don't overthink it. Social media has the memory of like a uh, housefly. So if you post something and you don't like it tomorrow, that's cool. Post something new tomorrow. It's not that big of a deal. Um, oh, and also the internet remembers and also agencies. So don't be ratchet on the social medias. I don't know if that makes sense. You can get fired <laughs> very easily. They just send you an email. <laughs> so don't be, have fun, but don't be ratchet.